Hello, my name is Casey Smith, and the title of this talk is Cyber Cartography, How to Model Cyber Terrain. Uh, this is recorded for B-Sides Boulder 2022 for the virtual track. Hope everybody's doing well, and thanks to the organizers for uh, giving us a chance to present virtually. Uh, not all of us could be there, but hope to, to meet up with everybody soon. So you can connect with me on Twitter at sub T. Thanks for watching uh, and or watching either at the event or later on, I appreciate it. And this talk will be some of it speculative and really just trying to drive curiosity and innovation. So feedback welcome. And I look forward to hearing uh, from you. Really three big ideas that I wanted to cover in this. And they are first is our models versus reality. How, how, are, how do we use models? How do they affect our perceptions or experiences? How do they align with reality? How do we update models? Secondly, uh, the idea that defense and offensive tools need the same perspective and that makes things better overall over time. Third is combining things and learning from other disciplines or other domains. So how can we draw from uh, domains like medicine, uh, you know, meteorology, and how can that inform our cybersecurity processes and models? And then lastly, along the way, some case studies and references that may be helpful for you if you like this. So these are some things I've been working on over the last few months. And so I always like this far side cartoon where these two spiders have this web across the slide and they basically say, if we, you know, if we pull this off, we'll eat like kings. So uh, if I pull this off, uh, it, you will be at, at a minimum entertained and hopefully um, find some useful content. So I want to start with a map. So some of you will recognize when you see this map immediately where this is, or you may even be able to quickly translate that to what it might look like over the horizon if you were to, to, to be standing at a point on this map and see it. Others of us, it might take more context or more perspective. So when you think about maps, we can look at this and we can see things like bodies of water, uh, various uh, slopes or steepness or grade of the terrain. We can see maybe communities and roads so, but it may not be enough to help us form a really clear picture of what this would look like. So we may need additional context. So how about now? Does that help at all? Provide any context? Some of you are thinking, no, uh, not even a little bit. So, you know, what about now? Sort of like if you've gone to the eye doctor where they uh, change the lenses, which is clearer. So this is Mount Elbert, the tallest 14er in the state of Colorado. This is a perspective uh, sort of standing on the road looking to the west, uh, just south of Leadville. And the reason I bring this up is it's important when we're describing a thing that we use maps, but maps are a reduction or an abstraction. And so the map is not the territory, <coughs> excuse me, and it may take multiple perspectives to get the ground truth. So the first part of this is really to drive that point home how we use these models versus the experience of a particular thing. Another example I wanna use is if I were to present this music to you, what does this sound like? What, what do you hear when you read this? And I know that may sound funny, but some, of, some people are, are trained and can actually instantly pick this out and hear this playing in their mind. Others of us need to, uh, need to actually hear the music and then we can start to see the patterns in the notes uh, on the page. So I'm gonna try and get this to play real quick and see if this helps identify this. Hopefully that helps to identify the song as Thunderstruck, the soundtrack for hacking. Of course, that's debatable, uh, but according to at least one news article, that's fact. So anyway, the idea, though, is some of us can look at that and, and see that I can't, but some people can look at that and, and hear that song. Others of us need to hear the song and then we can recognize the patterns uh, in the model or in the sheet music. So music can be transferred across time and location by writing it down. Uh, and then I, someone can put that on, on a uh, instrument and begin playing that by reading the music. Other of us have to hear it, others of us experience it. So again, the sheet music is not the song, 
the menu is not the meal, right? So models are always a, an abstraction of reality. So they help us describe things, talk about things, but it is very different than the experience itself. One of my favorite examples of this is from the movie Titanic, where early on in the movie, there's a uh, one of the analysts is describing using the model and simulation how the Titanic broke apart. So he's describing what happens and uh, and then the, the ship splits and, and sinks. And, you know, and then at the end, he says, pretty cool, huh? Uh, and he's talking to Rose, of course, who was on the Titanic when it sank. And she, she responds, uh, thank you for that fine forensic analysis, Mr. Bodine. Of course, the experience was somewhat different. So for those people who have been through an incident, who have had their organization attacked or have worked on incident response, they read threat reports very differently than those of us who may not have experienced that same situation. There's a lot of things happening that aren't captured or cataloged, right? How were emotions for the team? What were tensions like? What was communication like? Um, those aren't always captured and don't come out as opposed to those of us who read those reports and they're like, oh, he, they dropped the sign driver and elevated privileges, pretty cool, right? Maybe, but if you experienced it and it affected an outage in your organization, may not be. So just remember, the model or map of a threat report, there are people and organizations impacted by that actual report. So when we look at models from MITRE, like attack and defend, these are a great way like music to, in my opinion, to, to communicate a taxonomy, communicate things across time. So it helps us look at something and say, okay, they did a scheduled task or they did this particular technique. But again, think I think of these as recipes, right? These are not the meal, these are, these are a way of describing something, but there could be things we learn as we draw closer to the reality and the whole situation. Much like the mountaintop, we can be looking at a map. It's different than standing at the base and looking at the actual uh, event. So if you're not familiar with DEFEND, MITRE DEFEND is a, a relative newcomer to matrices or taxonomies for various attack patterns and defending against those. Some of these we would recognize very quickly, like say multi-factor authentication. Others of us would be terrified trying to inventory system firmware on uh, all these devices and trying to understand how to defend that. But the idea is it gives us at least a place where we can work from, uh, a measure of the terrain and know how we can improve. So these are really great. Hopefully you don't hear that I, I don't like these. I'm just trying to uh, share how I think about these models sometimes. Another very popular model is minor attack, and there's a matrix for various cloud, mobile. And these are really good at describing across the top. These are the goals of the adversary. So the adversary wants to achieve persistence at the top, and how they would do that might be by going up the stack or using one of the, the items in that column to achieve that particular uh, tactic. So Inside of each of these, these are very helpful, but again, they don't necessarily describe the way we understand them. When, when someone's describing supply chain compromise, I might think about that differently than you do. And so also keep in mind, this is very much like the model we have for sheet music. Some people can look at this and just play that attack out in their mind. Other of us, other, others of us need more context to understand what happened and to draw new insight and observation to what happened. So you might have a situation where on the left, you see these are these are the directions the attackers went. On the right, the blue team scrambling or incident response team sh scrambling. There may have been a few points where those intersected over time where we may have been able to disrupt or prevent or block downstream effects by the attacker. But overall, uh, sometimes they're not, things aren't as neat and uh, they don't resolve into boxes uh, as easily. So keep that in mind uh, as we go through this talk. So you'll see various models presented for an intrusion that are well organized and cyclical and you know attackers don't do uh, internal recon unless they've done initial recon, for example. So um, that is one way to think about it. Another way might be there are a lot of entry points. There's a lot of messiness to corporate and, and small business networks. And there's a lot of places attackers could start and move. What's important though, is we have a, a, an understanding or language. This is actually from Matthew Monty's book, Network Attack and Defense is a very good resource. If you haven't read it, I'd highly encourage you to take a look. But a real operation may look very different from a defender or even from an attacker's perspective. It's never as clean and easy as a, a simple spreadsheet. 
So that's part one, uh, really talking about how we think about models and how they affect reality. You know, uh, the map is not the territory. There's a, a clear distinction between the two. The next section I want to talk a little bit about is how offense and defensive tools need to share the same view. And once that happens, both attackers and defenders can start drawing the same conclusions or observations about what's happening. And so if either side has uh, an information asymmetry here, that may help them, right? They may have a tool that sees something that the defenders simply don't, or they may be aware of a blind spot in a tool that a defender is not aware of. So I use this example, I'll call it Cyberball. It's essentially a soccer field on the left, a basketball court on the right. And over on the left-hand side, these are defender rules. There's a lot of meetings. There's a lot of uh, can't pick up the ball with your hands. Uh, there's you know, a goalie that's guarding the, the, the net. But over on the right, an attacker has really no, is none of these same constraints. They can pick up the ball by their hands. They can throw it around. They can kick it. They can, uh, they're, they're trying to achieve a different objective than what's happening on the left side. Not a great analogy, but it, this is sometimes how I think about I, I see a lot of attackers playing one game, defenders playing another game. Attackers playing the game of trying to achieve an objective or hit a target. Defenders trying to do log searches, analytics, and, and uh, they, they don't always line up. And so it's almost like there's two different planes. So hopefully bringing these two into alignment, maybe it, at least is a theory I have that might help uh, organizations better understand and, and model attacks and defense. So when we think about an event, what would an analyst need to see before an event, during an incident, or after that could help them understand it better? Can we use that information to replay, to learn from? For example, why did it take us five hours to get the logs? Maybe next time it takes us an hour and a half. Next time it takes us 30 minutes. Is there a way to pause or look at our telemetry, rewind, even train people on that. So pause an analyst and ask, you know, hey, what would you do in this situation? Uh, give them a chance to think about it and, and play it out and see what happens. So that's where I think models can help us ask these what ifs, run through these scenarios, help people train. But we think differently about a map when we're traveling than we do when we're lost than when we're just sitting at home. Uh, and so different maps have different utility or models have different utility given the circumstances or the event that you're facing. As a defender, I want the same map that the attacker has. I want to know what they're looking at and try and outpace them or uh, make decisions before they make decisions on the same information and cut off the attack. So I might see, well, it's pretty obvious they're going to go after that bridge. So we may want to defend that area more heavily or whatever we're, we're talking about. But I want to hear the music. I don't want to read the music. I want to have the experience essentially that the attacker is having and, and looking at the network from that perspective to help inform where I need to defend. So what can they see? What can they touch or access? Those are the views that I want. So some of you have used uh, Cobalt Strike before, very popular red team adversary emulation tool, very popular with actual adversaries as well. And this is just a screenshot from their SMB lateral movement. And you can see how uh, an attacker could track which systems they've compromised. You can see what the uh, privileges, like are they system? Are they uh, just a normal user? You can also track in the tool uh, credentials that you've collected over time and from what source. So this might be how an adversary sees an engagement and moves through a network. And that may be very different than the way a defender uh, might see that same information. Uh, uh, Raphael has a really good talk called Flying a Cylon Raider. Encourage you to check that out if you're interested because he describes that sense of how do I take an attacker's perspective? How do I look at an attacker's tool uh, and use that to help inform defense? So really good stuff. One of the tools that I like that I think it represents this really well is a tool called Bloodhound. And I think it shows very clearly the benefits of attackers and defenders having the same view same information of a network. And so Bloodhound, if you're not familiar with the tool, is a tool that allows you to model active directory structures to then find uh, attack paths. So maybe you're a normal user and you want to elevate to domain admin, or maybe you have rights to this group and you want to elevate to another group. It does, it does quite a bit more, obviously. So I put some references here about how this tool has really changed our industry in terms of seeing active directory. 
And really a big shout out to Andy and the team uh, that's doing this work, because I think the attacker's view and the defender's view with Bloodhound is the same. So the idea is we're looking at the same data. And so we can draw conclusions about what we need to defend and how we can improve. So if I can run Bloodhound as a defender before uh, and an adversary does, I may be able to quickly cut off places where they could elevate privileges, weaknesses we might have in our active directory structure. So or configuration. So, so that to me, that's an example of offense and defense having the same view and everyone getting better uh, over time. So another tool might be something like InMap to do port scanning or some, some derivative of InMap. We're both using the same things to scan for open services, try and fingerprint targets. That is helpful to both attackers and defenders. So trying to find those places where the tooling provides the same visibility to both sides. And we're starting to see this more. I really like the team at Microsoft that's doing some of these visualizations. So here you can see an attack from ransomware. Uh, and you can actually start to see the flow of the attack mapped to various techniques on the right. But you begin to be able to understand, OK, uh, you know, credentials cannot be dumped until security controls are turned off or until they elevate privileges. So we start to see the ability to affect downstream behavior by understanding the attack flow versus just a, uh, a spreadsheet or a chart. So now we're starting to look for trails uh, on the map as opposed to just looking at the map together. Another blog from Microsoft is showing a similar thing. Now that all of a sudden looks a lot closer to the Cobalt Strike view of the network. And we can start to think about, oh, okay, you know, if the defender uh, if they hadn't been able to reach uh, node two, then they wouldn't have, nothing would have happened after that. So, okay, lesson learned, how do we iterate and improve? So that I think has been very valuable uh, for attackers and defenders to have the same view. And so there's some examples of this that you can use to experiment. There's Neo4j, which is a lot of the Bloodhound development, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there's D3 for JavaScript. I'd encourage you to experiment and try some of the different visualizations to see what is surfaced or what uh, might make sense. There, there's quite a bit of templates and models that you can use to see what would happen and ask questions, change the state, ask the question again. You know, if we, if we made this configuration change, how would that have affected this incident? You know, maybe the whole thing was, uh, you know, predicated on one thing being true. And if that was taken away, uh, everything would have collapsed. And that's how we can get better over time by using these types of models to understand that. At least that's my theory. So what kind of maps do we have? What kind of visualizations do we have in other domains, in other disciplines? You know, how can we learn uh, from those other disciplines? One of the things that I think is interesting that other disciplines do is look at data across time. So you functionally have, how could we model a network or a device state or configuration over time and go back in time and look at state, roll forward in time and see how changes play out. So if you think about meteorology or weather uh, models and data, you can see the value of these models is predictive, right? So I want to know what's going to happen on Friday so that I can make plans today. And so looking at various trajectories, inputs, and knowing where models work and where they fail. So some of you may be familiar with, you know, the concept of long-term weather prediction. It's not possible. I can't tell you what the weather will be like 10 years from now, but I can tell you what it will be like 10 hours from now. So understanding the value of these models and constantly changing inputs and seeing how that affects different things. Don't, I don't have an answer of what like a weather map would look like in terms of, of cybersecurity, but that's what I'm thinking about in terms of visualizations collecting some of this data and then looking at uh, maybe what it's telling us is going to happen or could possibly happen in the future. So a great example of where we do actually use time and looking at data across time is time travel debugging. This is uh, my first experience of this was from a talk by Brett Victor called Inventing on Principle in 2011. And so he was giving this presentation and he was talking about how he was trying to get his character to make a particular jump. And rather than trying to pick the numbers, he has a sliding bar, but that was still hard to see. So what he did is sort of turn on these trails for the, the character. And he could actually, by dragging the trails up or down, play out a different future for the character. 
until he got the exact amount. And so this has been incorporated into a number of commercial products. I'll show you in a moment. WinDebug and T-Train have both tools that use time travel debugging. And these, these are game changers for analysis because you can change input. You can, you can play out an exploit and roll something back, change the state, play it forward again, and see the effect. And that is really remarkable. So as we look at weather and how weather patterns can change over time, we can look at the state of things, even within a system, even within a debugger, uh, and see how that would play out over time. So when you think about reverse engineering and debugging, you know, a developer, a reverse engineer, they're trying to look at the same data. They're trying to see the same things. They use the same tools. So an exploit developer can use a, a Windy Bug or other tools, Ghidra, Ghidra Ida, uh, just like a, a software uh, developer could as well. So you can see here's an example from Windy Bug, moving forward, going back in time. And I think the real value is seeing something play out, back it up, change the state, play it again, and see if it has a different outcome. See if it actually uh, made a difference. So. I like this slide a lot. This is from T-Train's uh, website and they do time travel debugging and low level analysis for like kernel drivers and things like that. But you'll see here, they can track reads and writes of locations to memory over time. You can create bookmarks or uh, snapshots. You can then trace those <laughs> to a point in time where a write operation corrupted something that caused a crash and trace that back over time and see where it came from and see that it actually came from uh, the Ethernet interface. So these are things we haven't had. So these are new. So new models, new maps, new tools are going to give us new insight into how to defend and also how to attack. So I like their stuff. I think it's pretty neat. Another example that I've used is API Spy. And if you've ever looked at a, you know, you're in a debugger and you're, you see a create file call and you're not sure what the function parameters are. So you're context switching between uh, MSDN page, and then, you know, what are the inputs here? What does that structure look like? I like API Spy because I can simply hover over that function call and it will show me right away, oh, okay, I can see that first parameter is a pointer to a string or whatever it might be. So that gives us a lot quicker insight, a, a develop an intuition for maybe what's happening as we're troubleshooting something. So some of the best tools for troubleshooting and debugging can be really helpful for informing what we know about security incidents and situations. How we see things then, this is sort of my point, helps us make predictive and analytical and strategic decisions. So if an attacker is seeing something that I don't see, they may make a different decision than I might make. And so while there's always that element of human adaptation and, and innovation, um, we, we want to be more informed than the adversary. We want to know things that they may try. And, we may want to anticipate or disrupt their attack early in the chain. And we can't do that if we're looking at a, a map of Paris, you know, trying to defend Texas. Okay. So uh, what we can, we can predict where things are going. Our models can inform us, uh, you know, what questions we need to ask, et cetera. So one of my favorite tools uh, for web application testing, some of you are familiar with this, would be Bur is Burp Suite. And I love the Burp Suite interface, the, the plugins, the whole thing. It's just very elegant. And it allows me to then see the request and the response, parse the headers, look at different parameters, replay attacks, uh, fuzz or inject things at a particular point in time. Very, very powerful offensive tool uh, to, to go look at and start testing web applications. There are other web proxies that inspect data like Fiddler, uh, OWASP, uh, Zap proxy, uh, Charles proxy, uh, uh, MITM in, uh, in Python. But this is an example of seeing the data and then that informs our defense. So by running scans and running attacks, you know, we might see that, oh, for this particular method call, if I just count the response code. So response code 500 means the application couldn't handle it and something crashed in either the JVM or the, the web server. So those are important. And we, we can see an asymmetry here between, you know, get requests causing a 500 or a crash versus get requests causing a 200. And we may want to look into that. So I guess my point being here is, I'd really like my WAF to look more like Burp Suite, right? So if those are two different tools or whatever you're using to defend your website, the closer 
uh, the view of, you know, can come to looking more like an offensive security tool, I think we're, we're going to see dramatic improvements in insight. And so we're already starting to see that people using application monitoring data to help inform their defenses. So we could look at a parameter over time and say like, it's only ever a date. If it's something other than a date, whether it's a semicolon or a apostrophe, just kill the connection because I know that field should have always parse. Or why, you know, why is it a date 99% of the time and now all of a sudden it's a JSON object or YAML? So that tells me something's happening there, either a misconfiguration or somebody is sending those events. So anyway, hopefully that may, you may, it gets the point across. Like as a, as a defender of web applications, one of the advantages you have is all testing and all attacks are for the most part visible if you have the right verbosity and logs turned on. So you, you get to see all the failed attempts before the attacker actually may succeed. Uh, not often, but uh, sometimes. So another um, example for you, just I'll just leave this up here for you uh, to, to reference. This is a visualization tool using Ghidra, and it allows this situation, the analyst to really just scan through the data and all of a sudden some things start to, 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 to pop out uh, as, oh, that maybe that's an image, maybe, maybe that's another type of structure that's just a text string. But then we're leveraging the power of the you know, human brain to see the patterns here while the computer can then surface the data. So sort of combining the two strengths of both the computer analytics and the human pattern recognition to, to find something in a file that we may not, that may have been difficult to, to find um, otherwise. And if you like adversarial thinking or red teaming, you can use this same approach as well. You can think about, well, what does a defender see? What would they actually observe? And I like this uh, painting called Another World from MC Escher, which shows three different perspectives, the same frame, but it actually takes your brain a little bit of time if you pause the video and try and figure out, am I looking, I'm looking up, but I am, on, am I on the left or am I on the right? And I'm looking down and am I on the right or the left? And so those kind of context switches slow us down, can slow us down. And so how can we accelerate that? Um, but you might think about as an adversary uh, emulation team or red team, like what would a defender see here and how could I, either try and camouflage my activity or how could I you know, try and blend in? So when we talk about other domains, disciplines, so what, what can meteorology teach us about you know, cybersecurity? What can an astronomer teach us about cybersecurity? So you think about that for just a moment. Some of you will recognize where I'm going with that. The idea was from the book Cuckoo's Egg where Cliff Stoll was a astronomer that was called in to respond or essentially ended up responding to a pretty major cyber event in the late 80s. It's really good read, lots of good history, a lot of good approach and techniques there, but uh, we can learn a lot from other domains, whether it's meteorology, astronomy, or <coughs> uh, excuse me, medical, aviation, public safety, all those. A lot of these problems people have solved that we may not be aware of, and there may be techniques we can use and apply to cybersecurity in the models we use and the data we surface. So another reference is Carmen Medina's talk, a uh, keynote that she did uh, about diversity of thought and inclusion and different perspectives on solving problems. And she mentions one of the astronomers here, Cecilia, who by looking at things like photographs uh, from telescopes was able to infer makeup of stars and it's really fascinating uh, look at not only at the science, but also just uh, you know what she had to overcome to, to understand and, and reach those conclusions. So the way, the way we look at things and understand data may give us new insights. So in this particular part of the talk, Karma was just talking about the benefits of combining telescopes and photography, because up to that point, it was just somebody's, you know, uh, someone's word that they saw this thing at a particular time, but with a photograph or a recording, they were able to then, other people could study it and draw other conclusions. So how does that help us with models and cyber terrain? Well, we may, if we think about telescopes and photography, you know, what do we need to combine uh, with cyber? So, I, you know, I don't know, this is just an open question, but like, you know, what, how could you combine cybersecurity with Zillow or some, you know, or, or how could you combine it with a recipe site or drone perspectives or whatever you bring to the industry and your perspective may be really valuable for us because we may be missing something, but things that might help 
us think about this, be like, what takes a lot of time today? What's expensive today? What's tedious or error prone today? How do we reduce that, improve that, improve the quality? Those types of things we may draw from other domains. So some of you may have heard of the OODA loop and some of you may roll your eyes and stay with me. Um, but the idea of the OODA loop here is observe, orient, decide and act. And so this originated in the Air Force pilots looking at how to become better pilots and how to win uh, in dogfights and, and how to gain an advantage uh, over adversaries. And, and some theories are a lot of it's related to like the canopy or the bubble. Uh, pilots had a different view than uh, their opponents. And so this old movie from uh, with Clint Eastwood, the original Firefox, if you remember, you know, he has to steal this plane. And in order to do that, he has to think in Russian. Uh, so pretty cool, you know, uh, original Firefox before the browser. But the idea here is UDA is probably best experienced than taught. It's sort of like trying to describe to you how to play the piano versus letting you play the piano and see what that's like. And then you'll begin to to build repetition. So, so let me try and explain that, how I think about OODA and how I think about faster loops. So going faster from observe to act is how I interpret that. And, and that improves then our speed and agility as defenders. So one problem that you might have is imagine you're a large organization and you identify in your proxy server logs, a malicious domain was detected. Somebody tried to browse to a malicious domain. So now you have a lot of questions and how fast you answer those questions may inform the scale and size and duration of the incident. So once you understand there's a malicious domain in your logs, you have to ask, how did they get there? Which hosts performed the lookup? You know, was it just a lookup of a DNS name or did someone actually send an HTTP request? To that domain. And if, if it was a lookup, who performed the lookup? A proxy server or a domain controller? Um, there's a lot of questions, right? And so then we may want to go back and say, all right, now that I know that it was computer A, what was the process name on computer A that performed the lookup? Was it a browser? Was it maybe just, a, you know, a, someone typed something in wrong? Was it an injected ad? Or was it SVC host? What's the user agent? If it's an HTTP request, there's a lot of things here. Just by seeing a malicious domain in your proxy logs, you have to go answer. And then once you've answered one and two, you now have to sweep the organization and answer that for all of your hosts. Has anyone else talked to this domain? Has any other process talked to this domain? And then you repeat that cycle. And so that's the loop, right? That's the observe to act. And so by doing that in 12 seconds versus 12 hours, how quickly can you reboot, eradicate, clean up machines versus something that may have persisted in your network for a very long time? So by increasing the speed that our questions are answered, we can influence our ability to defend the organization. So that's how I interpret uh, some of the UDA models and things like that. I, I see value in it, but I see value in it in terms of doing it instead of just trying to describe it. So, but, by understanding how quickly you can answer questions, that makes you faster, right? So if I can pick up an enemy uh, aircraft 12 miles before they see me, that may change, you know, right? That all of a sudden you start thinking of where this comes from, that may change how we react. So the speed with which you ask and answer questions may affect outcomes of incidents, both at attacker or defender, and asking and answering faster than the adversary may be something that you'll strive for. How quickly could we answer that question? What tool do we need? What do we need to turn on in our logging to be able to do that faster? So, so that's UDA. If I think about observe, orient, decide, and act, it's a lot easier to do it. But also, if you break it down, then you can ask, how could we do this faster? So what's an example of this? Maybe that's where EDR uh, could help you, right? So you have a tool that now tracks every computer, every process and every domain they've talked to. And now you can answer the question in 12 seconds versus 12 hours versus 12 days. So that's where I'm going with these tools can, and models can help us improve our defense overall. And back to earlier when we were talking about drawing on other disciplines. So when we think about like telescopes, and photography being combined, what could we combine EDR with? So EDR by itself could actually maybe be a force multiplier, 
if we combined it with something else. So what about fraud analytics? And this is just pure speculation, but you could say like, you know how when I buy a credit card, you know, buy something and it's not me, the bank calls me or sends me a text and I say, nope, that wasn't me. What if that was possible with EDR? So what if, you know, your EDR system detected WMI spawning a command prompt and the user got a push notification? Hey, are you running command? No. How quickly could you then react or respond? Check with the user, give them a call. So the, the data then can be uh, inform us and, and that model then helps us get really quick. So we can deny the transaction in a few seconds or we can recognize it's holiday season and yes, that person's buying a TV or it's the end of cycle maintenance and yes, they're running WMI and we get better over time, but just simply asking a question might be a way to improve the process. So hopefully that makes sense. So just, just combining ideas like that, like how could we you know, use uh, a fraud notification in the financial industry and combine that with endpoint telemetry. I don't know. Another thing you might do is enrich the context or the data that you're presenting. So if you look at a, a other graphs, you might just see nodes, but here an analyst uh, can actually see a keyed map and they can actually see the data, oh, all right, that's a file, right? That's a file modification. That's a process spawning a network connection. So by seeing the relationships and quickly understanding, that may help an analyst pivot to another tool that shows them, oh, I need to go look for any EXE file in the app data local temp file or with the name temp in it. Or maybe I need to go look for any executable that has a single letter. So like show me every executable that has like e.exe almost always evil. So that is from JP Cert. They have a tool called Syspon Search that kind of enriches the view. Uh, so trying to draw from different uh, visualizations, we've looked at Bloodhound, Active Directory. We've looked at debuggers. We've looked at uh, Burp Suite, looking at endpoint data. So hopefully this is connecting with uh, maybe some of you, di different visualizations and giving you ideas about how these maps and models improve our understanding. I like this one uh, from Edward Tufts. He has a class I'll reference at the end about data visualization and modeling. And so what we wanna teach folks or what I, what I think we want to teach people is how to react and adapt to situations and use the tools that they have. So if the, the thing I like about this is here, here I am looking at the dishwasher matrix and I, if I have a number five tablespoon in my hand, I don't know where it goes. There's nothing on this that tells me, so what do I do with this tablespoon that doesn't fit the, the grid? And so that can help us you know how we're using the tools. So I, I much more want as, as a senior or principal and training new analysts, I want them to be able to adapt and react much more like um, maybe a surgeon does where we're training them, you know, see one, teach one, do one, so to speak, where they're getting the hands-on practice, maybe guided or in a controlled environment. But uh, it's not enough just to give someone a matrix and just say, go hunt. It's just like giving somebody uh, an anatomy chart and saying, go do heart surgery. So there's got to be a way to train people. There's got to be a way to use these models to help people learn over time. One of the books I like is by Dr. Atul Gawande. He wrote a book called Complications that he actually wrote while he was a surgical intern that talks about this and talks about the challenges. But um, we need to teach people to, to do the work and be able to adapt and provide feedback. If the tool is not working, that needs to be something that they can provide to us. So again, trying to draw from a, a domain like medical training or surgical training, how might that inform how we train security analysts? We don't just turn them loose. There's more of an apprenticeship and working together uh, to both learn because uh, the senior or principal or role can learn from someone with new perspective. They could be like, it takes you like seven steps to copy the, you know, event log domain into the sim. Why don't you just do this? So it's mutually beneficial. So, uh, or building muscle memory. So if you remember in the karate kid towards the end, uh, early in the movie, rather, uh, Daniel has been doing all these, this work. He's been sanding floors, waxing cars, painting fences. He doesn't really understand why he's doing these various things until Mr. Miyagi starts throwing punches and kicks at him. And he realizes he's learned by wax on wax off. He's developed muscle memory, uh, to respond and react to these things. So 
we work on the models, we study and understand, but ultimately it's the experience of the thing that is going to be how we use these and how they help uh, make us better and improve our understanding. So, okay, so some closing thoughts. Uh, our tools, our maps, our models, they matter. We've covered a lot of ground. We've talked about how the map is not the territory. We talked about combining tools. So offense and defense have the same view. We talked about different industries and different parts of cybersecurity where that's true. Things like debuggers, time travel debugging, uh, web application attack tools, Bloodhound, et cetera. I want to close with this, and I think this is an important concept, is that you get what you measure is a quote from Richard Hamming. And essentially, he tells this story where the fishermen go out and they catch fish in the nets and every, they conclude that there are no fish smaller than a particular size because they've never seen them in the net. And so the takeaway here is the instrument affects what you see. The size of your net is uh, going to affect the size of the fish you can catch. Um, seems obvious, sometimes we forget it. Hopefully that's a good reminder. And another quote I like from Carmen Medina is, our ability to know is a function of our tools for knowing. So our ability to combine telescopes and photography is going to improve our understanding over time. Our ability to take cybersecurity tools and models and map them over time helps us see things. So, okay, we covered a lot of ground. Thank you for uh, bearing with me through that. Hopefully this was informative. There's some references for MITRE attack and defend. Uh, one of the uh, plugins in MITRE Caldera's game board, which is a, a trying to do something very similar to what we described where offense and defense have the same picture. And a lot of my thinking and ideas that around these visualization came from a class that I took. Uh, Edward Tuff's course on visualization is outstanding. If, if you want to take it, it's super fun. Uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll bring new ideas. So looking forward to those of you who are new to the industry and those of you who are seasoned veterans, how, what we can do to learn from each other and draw from various domains. So thank you for your time. And I look forward to seeing you all in person and hopefully you'll have a good rest of the event.